Welcome to our study tonight. Before I begin, let me tell you that uh, yesterday I had the opportunity to go on the Roxanne and Ace program and do a podcast. Uh, it was, I was really excited about it. They're great people. And uh, I would encourage you to try to, to try to find it. It's going to be downloaded on most social media pl platforms and on YouTube uh, this Friday morning, actually Thursday night, but late. So if you want to go on, it's a, it's a, I was really impressed with them. And listen, if you're on their channel, please subscribe to them also. They're great people. They love the Lord and uh, did a great interview. So just want to let you know about that. Let's talk about it in the news tonight. Let's talk a little bit about Israel. Did Biden just hand Hamas a big gift in its war against Israel? President Joe Biden on Saturday warned Israel not to invade Hamas's remaining stronghold in Gaza. Experts say that this would only, would only ensure Hamas's survival and the recovery. So to go this far, not to do that, but obviously the president is giving Israel some hard times. The president of the United States is citing casualty figures that were given to him from Hamas, designated, a designated terror organization, and it's absolutely inexcusable that he's doing that. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu responded to Biden's comment on Monday and said that Israel is going to push into Rafah, which is their last stronghold of Hamas, regardless of any outside opinions. I thank him for that because basically you have to wipe them out or they will regroup. The Biden administration is studying options of creating an independent Palestinian state and demanding, demanding that Israel scale back its counteroffensive measures. Netanyahu said, that is absolutely not possible. Roughly 75% of Jewish people support a ground assault in Rafah. And so basically, Israel has no choice but to go into Rafah, where four Hamas battalions and the Gaza-Egypt tunnels that resupply Hamas and with weapons are still standing. The Israeli government is preparing to present a plan for the invasion in efforts to protect civilians in the region in a bid to quell U.S. and international humanitarian concerns. The State Department said on Monday that the Biden administration will look at Israel's plan when it's ready and likely give an opinion of it. Let me, let me just tell you something. Number one, I don't care about Biden's opinion. Number two, I don't think the world does either. And number three, it's ridiculous to me that we could support Ukraine's efforts against Russia. We don't ask Russia to send humanitarian aid to the Ukraine, yet we're asking Israel to do that, and they've done it. And now we're asking them not to even go in. That's absolutely ridiculous. It's Israel's war. We need to stay out of it. Talking about Israel, some end time things are really starting to take shape in Israel. I told you a little about this uh, before, but I want to give an update on it. Red heifers ready for the temple by this Passover. Game changing developments are happening right now in Israel concerning the third temple. Meanwhile, Hamas is watching the developments very closely and have even claimed to be a major part of their motivation for the heinous, the heinous October 7th terror attack. With tensions already at boiling point across the Middle East, will we shortly see Israel take bold steps to, re to rebuilding the temple? The final missing piece of the third temple project, as I've told you before, is the infamous ashes of a red heifer. It's now only months away to falling into place. Without the red heifer ashes, priests and Levi Levites currently in training, currently in the Temple Mount Institute, are disqualified from serving in a future rebuilt temple. With all the bloodshed of the Temple Mount, down through the centuries, the mound itself must be cleansed before the temple can be rebuilt. So, we know that a, a Christian rancher from Texas baffled rabbis in 2022 as he invited them to his ranch to inspect what turned out to be five unblemished red heifers, not one single hair, first time ever. What happened next sounds almost like it was taken from a Hollywood movie script. As the heifers were airlifted to Israel at around one year old, how do you even go about flying a cow to Israel? I don't know. Being greeted at the airport with a special ceremony by rabbis officiated by them, the heifers were then taken out of public eye to continue being quietly and meticulously groomed for the sacrifice and, of course, watched. Although one of the five was disqualified last year due to the emergence of a, two white hairs, the remaining four remain on track to be eligible to be sacrificed this year. Please listen to what I'm saying. The Temple Institute rabbis hope to perform this ceremony prior to Passover this year, while other sources claim it will happen sometime between Passover and Pentecost. So it's extremely close. While the story of the flight of the five heifers to Israel and their subsequent journey has certainly stirred great excitement among Temple activists, as well as Christian students of the Bible prophecy, it curiously hardly got a mention in mainstream Israeli news. It will surprise many Christians to discover that by and large, secular Israelis 
are uninterested and unaware of these developments. However, the radical Islamic world understands the significance of the arrival of the red heifers very well and are incensed by their presence. It was no coincidence that a mosque called its deadly October 7th massacre of Israelis, Operation Al-Aqsa Flood. Abu Abeda, a Hamas spokesman, said that the aggression against, quote, our path in Al-Aqsa reached its peak with the, quote, bringing in of the red heifers. Israeli government officials of all persuasions are highly aware of Islamic sensitivities concerning the Temple Mount and have through the years repeatedly committed themselves to maintaining what they called a status quo, nothing changes on the Temple Mount for this very reason. Both the Old and New Testament Bible prophecy is clear that the Temple will be rebuilt in the last days. In his famous Olivet Discourse, Jesus predicted, and I'm quoting, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, the temple, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, for then there will be great tribulation. It's Matthew 24, 15 to 21. Jesus' Jewish listeners would have understood his words completely and literally. While many Israelis are unaware of these developments, so too is much of the church. It's just not preached. It's not taught. Just as he promised, Jesus soon returned to this earth to rule. And these developments point us to the very, very nearness of his coming. And I know we've been saying that for a long time, but trust me, this is a, a huge step forward. We should be preparing ourselves for the soon fulfillment of prophecy, doing everything in our power to be ready for that great day. Days of great tension definitely lie ahead. But God's purpose in the midst of these shakings is to bring many people into his kingdom. May we all play our part in this significant time in history. In the meanwhile, let me tell you about China. The Bible talks about war and rumors of wars. China is actively preparing for war with the United States. Let me repeat it, because you're not hearing it on any news. China is actively preparing for war with the United States. At a time when their economy is really struggling, if anybody knows history, most big nations, when their economy struggles, cranks up the war machine because it boosts their economy. The Chinese are increasingly increasing military spending and ramping up preparations for war. But who is China preparing to fight a war with? Needless to say, the answer to that question is extremely obvious. The Chinese would be fighting a major war with, with, with the United States, and right now Chinese shipyards are churning out military vessels at a pace that as the U.S. simply cannot match. The latest vessel, the Fujian, features catapults to launch heavy fixed-wing aircraft with immense bomb payloads. And they're also building a new type of amphibious assault vehicle. Of even greater concern is the vast network of tunnels that the Chinese have been constructing. The Chinese tunnel, tunnels stretch for hundreds of miles, and their plans are so closely guarded that Western intelligence agencies have little idea what is down there. One spy recently, paid by the West, was killed in those tunnels. Nobody knows why China has been putting so much effort into these ch tunnels. Nobody knows what they're for. Are they anticipating that vast numbers of Chinese will need to shelter underground during an apocalyptic conflict with the United States? And the Chinese have been feverishly upgrading and expanding their strategic nuclear arsenal. More than 100 nuclear missiles with multiple warheads have already been built and armed. Now, most of the time, if I tell people this in America, it's like, oh, okay, so what? <laughs> we have to take notice. We can't put our head in the sands. The moment the Chinese invade Taiwan, and they will, they know that it will mean war with the United States. The U.S. could try to threaten China with nukes, but if China now possesses enough missiles to wipe out dozens of U.S. cities, our leaders may not want to risk a nuclear confrontation. Interestingly, as talk of war with China has heated up, the number of Chinese migrants coming over into our southern border has spiked exponentially. The last year, 37,000 Chinese citizens, mostly men of military age, were apprehended crossing, crossing illegally from Mexico into the United States. That's 50 times more than two years earlier. Something is happening. The news isn't going to tell you, but something's going on. And so the Biden administration was just letting them in. Meanwhile, Western nations continue to prepare, prepare for an all-out war with Russia. Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia have been some of the loudest members of NATO that have urged the Western bloc to prepare for war. Russia has 10 times more tactical nukes than the United States does. They have the most sophisticated intercontinental ballistic missile on the entire planet. The Russians also have the most advanced anti-missile systems in the world by a very, very wide margin. 
and we don't have any anti-missile systems that can handle what the Russians can throw at us. That's the first time ever. We cannot, we cannot intercept their intercontinental ballistic missiles. On top of everything else, the war in the Middle East could be drastically escalating at any moment. And North Korea's military has been put in a state of heightened readiness for war. 2024, I'm afraid, will be a year of war. Admiral Rob Bauer, who chairs NATO's military committee, has warned people to make basic preparations for a potential full-blown war. Quote, you need to have water, you need to have a radio and batteries, you need to have a flashlight on batteries to make sure that you can survive the first 36 hours. He said it starts there, the realization that not everything is planable. At this moment, most people living in the Western world have absolutely no idea how much the hot phase of World War III will change their lives. Sadly, it will be way too late when most people of the population finally awaken out of their slumber. And again, ominous news, but I don't want to not tell you these things because nobody else is telling you these things. And this is what Jesus told us was going to happen. Wars and rumors of wars. This one's underneath religion. Anti-Christian violence expected to explode if Trump wins the election. Now, remember, all these articles I'm reading to you and all these things that are happening this week are right in line with what Jesus told us in Matthew 24. One after another after another. Wars, persecution, famine, all the way down the line. Now, listen to this one. Anti-Christian violence in the United States has risen dramatically in recent years. But what we have seen so far is nothing compared to what could be coming if the 2024 presidential election goes a certain way. Most of the violence being directed at Christians today are done, is done for political reasons. Not for what we believe necessarily, but for political reasons. Many on the left consider evangelical Christians to be Donald Trump's most hardcore supporters. And church buildings are the most visible representation of the evangelical movement. They are easy targets, and they're being attacked at a frequency that we have never seen before in the entire history of this country. Church attacks in the United States, I've told you before, have risen 800% during the last four years. While the Biden administration cracks down on Christian Democrats and the press smear as extremists, church attacks are up 800% in the last four years, according to a new report from the Family Research Center. The report found hostile church instances more than doubled in 2023, compared to 2022. These attacks are all about what is happening in the political realm. When a crazed woman walked in Joel, into Joel Olstein's Lakewood church and started shooting, it wasn't because she hated his preaching. She was a pro-Palestinian radical that hated evangelical support for Israel. They found something in her purse that had Palestine on it. We're entering the most chaotic election season in U.S. history. I've been praying every night for this upcoming election. The Lincoln Project is already releasing ominous videos warning that Trump will become a dictator and hordes of liberal pundits are breathlessly telling us that another Trump presidency will end the America as we know it today. There are millions of leftists that are deeply internalizing this message. And if Trump wins, they'll be ready for action. They've been violent in the past. They will definitely be violent in the future. Leftists are already buzzing about a revolution all over social media. And politicians on the left are certainly not helping matters nor is the liberal media. For example, Bernie Sanders insists that another Trump presidency will mean, quote, the collapse of American democracy. We are so deeply divided, and a movie entitled The Civil War is about to be released as, as the upcoming presidential election looms over our nation. The upcoming release of a 24 Civil War during a contentious presidential election year comes amid worry about the prospect of an actual civil war or at least real-life political violence, and has some questioning the movie's timing. For many on the left that do not worship God, politics is essentially their religion. And to them, the worst thing that could ever possibly happen would be for Donald Trump to become president again. So if Trump wins the election in November, we are going to witness a nationwide outpouring of negative emotion, negative emotion that will be unlike anything any one of us have experienced in the past. We could potentially see civil unrest on a scale that many would consider to be unimaginable right now. You need to pray for the upcoming election. Under religion also, progressives want to dismantle institutions which hold a biblical worldview. Standing for biblical truth will eventually come at a cost. We need to remember 2 Timothy 3.12, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. World Vision, a Christian relief and development agency, did not hire a candidate who failed to meet their standard for employees 
to abide by a Christian se sexual ethic. The candidate, who was in a same-sex marriage, sued World Vision, demanding the organization to change its biblical standards about marriage and sexuality or face a time-consuming discrimination lawsuit. Such lawsuits have been filed against the Roman Catholic Church and the Roman Catholic Schools in Indiana and North Carolina following termination of employee contracts for counselors and teachers who entered same-sex marriage against the Catholic teaching. Courts constantly hear cases arising from LGBTQ activists who feel entitled to have their view of morality foisted upon churches and ministries. You see, it was never enough to have freedom to marry in all 50 states, which they have, or to celebrate rainbows for an entire month each June, June which they do, or to dominate secular discourse, which they do, or entertainment and education. The new frontier is to demand, dismantle the beliefs, the traditions, and the institutions that have yet to affirm progressive sexuality, namely churches and ministries with a biblical worldview. Employment laws are a primary tool to chisel, chisel away at enduring biblical beliefs about God's merciful design for marriage, family, and relationships. Judges and legislators can be poor theologians, and church autonomy, long a standard with, within American law, insists judges and legislatures limit interference with religious beliefs, decisions, and practices of ministries. Supreme Just, Court Justice Neil Gorch, Gorsuch wrote that uncertainty about religious freedom comes at a cost. Religious groups across the country, he said, will pay the price in dollars, in time, and in continuing uncertainty about their religious liberties, end of quote. Justices Samuel Alto and Clarence Thomas wrote that forcing a ministry to hire messengers who do not share their religious views threatens the continued viability of that ministry. So it's time for the Supreme Court to provide certainty and clarity that ministries do not have to forfeit cherished beliefs in order to lawfully exist, thereby honoring First Amendment as intended in 1791. This is an amazing story I think every single person needs to hear. I'm bringing it to you tonight so I can tell you that all the things you think about St. Patrick's Day are wrong. And we need to know the truth about St. Patrick's Day. Unfortunately, it'll be celebrated in many countries. One of the most celebrated, you'll hear me say it, celebrated festivals in, in many, many countries all over the world. But it's not a time just to get drunk and wear, wear green. There is a tremendous Christian heritage to St. Patrick's Day. The amazing true story of the real St. Patrick. St. Patrick really did exist. And the ripple effects of what he accomplished during his lifetime are still being felt today. Sadly, very, very few people know the true story of this remarkable man. Once you understand what really happened, you will never view St. Patrick's Day the same way again. You won't after hearing this tonight. Today, most people regard St. Patrick's Day as an excuse to wear green and get drunk, as I said. According to Wikipedia, St. Patrick's Day is celebrated in more nations than any other national festival. In Ireland, in Canadian province of Newfoundland, in Labrador, in Montserrat, United Kingdom, Canada, Brazil, United States, Argentina, Australia, South Africa, New Zealand. St. Patrick's Day is celebrated in more countries than any other national festival. So what was, so was there an actual historical figure that inspired this holiday? Well, the answer is, in, is a resounding yes. But the truth is, St. Patrick wasn't even Irish. His name was Maiwan Sukkot. He was born in Britain around 387 AD to Christian parents. But he did not embrace the faith of his parents during his youth. He wrote extensively about himself. He considered himself to be idle and callow when he was a boy. A turning point came when he was taken captive by Irish, age, Irish raiders at the age of 16. Patrick was taken prisoner by a group of Irish raiders who were attacking his family's estate. They transported him to Ireland where he spent six years in captivity. During this time, he worked as a shepherd, outdoors and away from people. Lonely and afraid, he turned to his religion for solace and became a very devout Christian. He was finally able to escape after six years in Ireland, and he was reunited with his family. But sometime later, he was instructed in a dream to return to Ireland as a missionary. According to his writing, a voice which he believed to be God spoke to him in a dream, telling him it was time to leave Ireland. To do so, Patrick walked from County Mayo, where it was believed he, he was held, to the Irish coast. After escaping to Britain, 
Patrick reported that he experienced a second dream, a second revelation. An angel in a dream tells him to return to Ireland as a missionary. Patrick's return to Ireland was spectacularly successful. Vast numbers of people gave their lives to Christ, and he founded hundreds of churches. St. Patrick was tremendously effective and saw many pagans turn, turn to put their faith in Christ. He even suffered imprisonment and persecution in the hand, at the hands of the Druids. But his dedicated and tireless evangelistic efforts resulted in his baptizing, you ready for it? 120,000 new believers and building over 300 churches in Ireland. He served and worked among the people for 30 years before he died on March 17th, 461 AD, and was buried in Ireland. But that's only half the story. Patrick's preaching was accompanied by extraordinary miracles. According to one source, Patrick actually raised 33 people from the dead during his ministry. For the blind and the lame, the deaf and the dumb, the, the palsied and the lunatic, someone writing during his time, the leprous, the epileptic, all who labored un under any disease, did he in the name of the Holy Trinity restore to power of their limbs and of their entire health. And in these good deeds, what was he daily practiced? Patrick started a fire, which literally continued for hundreds of years. The churches that he established sent out missionaries that took the gospel throughout Europe and all over the known world. Missionaries went out from Ireland to spread the gospel throughout the world. It was the Irish monasteries that helped preserve the Christian faith during the Dark Ages. Patrick was the most influential figure in the history of Celtic Christianity. But, again, he was not Irish. And here it is. He was born in Britain, and it turns out that his ancestors actually came to Britain from the land of Israel. It's a funny thing that two apparently Anglo heroes of old have origins in the Promised Land. Patron Saint of England, Saint George, came from the lot from Lod near Tel Aviv, where the Ben Gurion Airport is today, with a Greek father and an Israeli mother. Although George probably wasn't Jewish, some people say it's quite possible that he was. Early writings, however, suggest that Saint Patrick was, moreover, and that he was from the tribe of Judah. Now, listen, because I know it's blowing your mind tonight. At the time that Patrick was born, there was a huge number of people of Jewish descent living in Britain. And many of them believed in Jesus as Messiah, Messianic Jews. Many Jewish people fled the land of Israel as the Roman oppression stepped up and were effectively first forced in the country in 135 AD. They went into the surrounding nations, including Jewish families who believed in Jesus as Messiah while maintaining Jewish customs and lifestyles. Many names of the nobility in Britain at that time were Jewish. After our Lord had died on the cross for the sins of human race, the Roman army laid waste Judea and Jews taken captive were dispersed among the nations of the earth. Some of them settled among the Amoric Britons, and it's stated that it was from them St. Patrick traced his origin. Today, we would refer to Patrick as a Messianic Christian, a Messianic Jew. Even though he's now considered to be a saint by the Catholic Church and the Lutheran Church and the Church of Ireland and the Eastern Orthodox Church, Patrick did not believe anything that they believed. In fact, in Patrick's original writings, he, quote, never mentions either Rome or the Pope. He recognized no other authority but other than the word of God. Stout-hearted Patrick refused to bow his neck to any such yoke of bondage. During Patrick's time and in the centuries that followed, the Celtic Church did things very differently than the Catholic Church did. Unlike the Roman Catholic Church, the Celtic Church did not believe in purgatory. They did not pray to Mary. They did not honor the Pope. The clergy married and, and reared children. They baptized believers, not infants, by immersion. And are you ready for this? They celebrated Passover. They did not celebrate Rome's Easter, and they kept God's seventh-day Sabbath. They shunned the unclean meats and decried the Roman church's hierarchy. Their burning desire was to keep the faith of the original, that the original apostles lived. This fact has been transported from the land of Israel to the land of Britain. And under St. Patrick, a revival began that swept across the entire known world. Sadly, Hardly anyone knows about any of the things that I've just shared with you. Instead, in our time, in our time, St. Patrick is considered to be a time for drinking and partying. How, how pathetic. We need to really fight, tell the, take this article, take what I've said, and tell your friends, tell your neighbors, because that's what it's about. It's a great time to, it's a great time to evangelize yourself. And lastly tonight, Americans pay $100,000 for officials to travel the globe spreading transgenderism under moral decay. President Joe Biden is the most fi financially reckless president in American history. 
Currently, the U.S. sits at $34 trillion in debt. Despite this, Biden has continually attempted to funnel millions, sometimes billions of taxpayer dollars towards student loan forgiveness, Ukraine, and perhaps most prominently, woke ideology. And many argue the latter is worse than them all. Biden's financial recklessness includes the amount of money he has put towards furthering LGBT ideology. Aside from the $1.4 million approved for the, the Department of Health and Human Services to assist trans identifiers, news broke this past Monday that, Biden official, that a Biden official makes six figures solely to travel and push the LGBT agenda throughout the globe. Her name is Jessica Stern. She has, she has what some consider a dream job. She gets paid over $180,000 to travel the, the globe. So far, she's ventured to at least at least 15 continents, excuse me, six con continents. Uh, the job sounds fantastic. That is until you find out what Stern actually does. As the State, State Department's special envoy, envoy, excuse me, Stern is tasked with one purpose, to advance the human rights of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and intersex persons. Her job includes promoting far-left views on sex and gender, lobbying foreign governments, and assisting activist organizations. She was appointed by President Biden in 2021 as part of his push for wokeism, which he classified as a U.S. foreign policy priority. Let me repeat it. A U.S. foreign policy priority. Stern has met with several foreign government officials already, including Brazil's Minister of Human Rights, Foreign Affairs, Health, Labor, Justice, and Native People, as well as members of the Swedish Ministry on Foreign Affairs, the Swedish International Development Cooperation Agency, and the members of the Swedish Parliament, and the list goes on and on. Stern's position was first created under the Obama administration. It was then left vacant on President Donald Trump. That should tell you something. Now watch. But Biden reassigned her. Pushing LGBT-specific policies around the world is a coercive attempt to change the foreign cultures and laws from afar and displaces human rights like religious freedom, and it's absolutely imbecilic. It's imbecilic to think that you're going to take these nations who have their lifelong traditions and try to make them woke. It's not going to happen, and we're wasting money doing it, and we're blackmailing countries to do it. We're telling them we won't give them support. From the beginning, the Biden administration has had entirely misplaced foreign policy priorities. There are wars taking place in Ukraine and Gaza, mounting hostilities from China, as I've been telling you, strained relationships with U.S. allies. Yet, according to State Department officials, LGBT issues are a top foreign policy priority for President Biden. This man isn't, isn't decreasing in his knowledge. I don't think he has a brain, to be honest with you. Ne definitely not a foreign, uh, for foreign affairs. This is not only immoral, it's ineffective po foreign policy. The Biden administration's radical LGBT push does not represent all Americans, and many Americans would be appalled by the LGBT policies that American diplomats are urging other countries to adopt and accept. It's downright abusive for high-level U.S. diplomats like Stern to travel to smaller, more dependent countries and pressure them to enact radical social policies invented by leftist Western elites. Doing so is harmful not only to the societies, it also harms U.S. relations with these other countries that don't want to endure the Biden administration's bullying. Um, let me give you a little history as I close the end of the news tonight. The Shah of Iran was, a, was an American puppet. He was, he was educated in America. He wore traditional suits. He was all America, and we were pushing all of our, all of our policies on him. He was a, Iran was an, was an ally during his time. He was overthrown, and the people hated his guts. Why? Because America, for years, had pushed him on them instead of letting them have their own religion, and we faced the consequences from Iran. It's exactly what we're doing with LGBTQ pushing it around the globe. It will come by, back to bite us. That's in the news for tonight. Obviously, we have plenty to pray about, but I want to get you to the good news today. And I want to...